luckily I have two more uh, in my inbox. But uh, first of all, uh, let's start with Boris, if you want to briefly introduce yourself. So you can simultaneously re look at the slide and listen to his presentation. So go ahead. Well, I can't really see the project slide from here. I mean, I can see that it's there. Which is well, good. tell us a little bit but about Anyway, yourself. I'll tell you Hopefully what's on can. it because I wrote it, so I should still remember most of the content. Uh, so my name is uh, Boris Hayit, um, and uh, I have some background in computer science, a couple of degrees there, and a PhD in bioinformatics where um, I've uh, studied with Jim Collins and Tim Gardner and worked on um, gene network inference and uh, applications of that to uh, various areas of disease. In particular, I worked with bacteria with resistance and persistence. Um, I've also worked with some um, human data during my time there. Then I moved on uh, to uh, GNS Healthcare so directly uh, to industry. And uh, I've been there for a while. I am um, an associate director of systems biology. And I lead a group with a focus on the type of types of applications that uh, we've seen over the last three days. Um, so um, that's basically what I do. The company itself is a small startup located in Cambridge, uh, in, in Kendall Square. So we're sort of in the suburbs because we're about four blocks away from the center. Uh, but uh, more or less, we're. Uh, where most of the industry is and look pretty close to MIT. Um, we do um, various systems biology applications um, and also applications in healthcare, um, such as you know, um, modifying uh, population risk and things like that, so predictive analytics for healthcare. Um, and in systems biology, the applications that we do are very similar to the variety of dream challenges that we've seen so far. And in fact, um, during this conference, I finally understood what I do in a few words. I do dream projects for a living. So that about summarizes it. And uh, I'm ready to hand over the mic. All right. So uh, for the remainder, we're now going to actually go uh, in order from left to right, since I have um, Andrea's slide. So let's see. go ahead, Andrea. So um, I actually have done what the opposite of what most sane people would do, which is I've spent about 16 years in industry and then went to academia, uh, which has been a very interesting uh, relation. I think actually one thing that may be in interesting for this audience is that, that the experience that I've had in industry has been really transformational for me in terms of how to organize my work in academia, because I found that very often academic environment not necessarily well organized and, and structured and um, and so sometimes having uh, the ability to sort of relate to project management in a way that is not typically thought of in academia really, really helps. So I spent about um, 13 years at IBM uh, from 1986 to, to about 2000 and IBM has been a fantastic environment. In fact, Gustavo is, is still there and we have very uh, prolific uh, uh, collaboration. But at the time, they decided that they didn't want to do any experimental biology within IBM, so they would allow us to do a lot of computation, but no experimentation. And that's one of the reasons why, why I left, because I thought that at that time, around 2000, uh, being able to do experimental biology was going to be really uh, relevant. And so I first started a company called First Genetic Trust that has been active for six years, from 2000 to 2006, and has then been morphed into a, a very large consortium called the Serious Adverse Event Consortium that is run uh, still with the participation of 12 pharmaceutical companies and four research centers and all the data analysis done through our Columbia Center. Um, and then uh, another company in 2008 called Therosis that was devoted to using systems biology approaches to develop a better understanding of drugs for prioritization uh, in, during development, including mechanism of action and uh, 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 sort of synergy in particular, and, uh, um, and also biomarkers that could be used for uh, uh, clinical investigation. Well, if you went from industry back to academics, I went the other way. Um, I work for Sanofi. Uh, my background is mostly as a physicist and as a mathematician. I was a quantum field theorist doing nuclear many body problem at MIT, and if you think it's hard to get a job in bioinformatics, come ask me stories. I'll tell you how hard it is to get a job at that. Um, 
I, uh, I, I basically ended up working for a variety of smaller companies earlier, uh, doing uh, sort of statistics and artificial intelligence and machine learning, finally statistical learning and bioinformatics. The trajectory seems to have been to work for larger and larger companies over time, and now I work for Sanofi, which has about 120,000 employees. We're about the third or fourth largest pharma in the world, depending on exactly what variable you measure and on what day you measure it. If you can figure out why nobody's ever heard of us, I'd be pleased to hear why that is. Uh, <laughs> We do, uh, as you might expect, at that size, a little bit of everything. We have an integrated pharmaceutical operation in oncology and inflammation and neuro and a whole bunch of other things, as well as vaccines. Your flu shot has about a one-third chance of being one of ours this year. Um, I tried to uh, distill uh, last night uh, I everything I could think of to tell somebody who wanted an in industrial job into, into about uh, five things, but I'll only tell you one uh, right now, which is essentially my career has been uh, a pretty erratic one. Uh, try something, see what works. This company folds. Try something else, go somewhere else. Um, the moral has been uh, my particular talent was to listen to somebody who could vaguely describe a problem and then be able to transform that into something which is mathematical and testable. Uh, that's my idiosyncrasy. And so my advice to you would be find your idiosyncrasy. There's something that you do so well that it's much better than what anybody else does. Then go find the people who want to have that done and talk to them. Uh, and and, and that, will, that will marry both your skills and your passion with something that will get you paid and you can maybe do some good in the world. So for me, it was talking to biologists and getting them to think about their data in a quantitative way. Um, I'm one of those biologists, um, Monica Boyle. I'm uh, actually, we're working currently at a uh, biotech company um, in San Diego uh, called uh, Dart Neuroscience. And um, our work is focused on really trying to uh, identify uh, technologies and small drugs that will enhance memory. Um, so uh, I'm here actually uh, along with one of my colleagues, Amir uh, Fayezadeen. Uh, we both are members of the invertebrate neurogenomics um, group at uh, DART. It's a, a small group. It's uh, roughly um, 12. Um, scientists, associate scientists, um, but um, our work is really trying to identify, um, it's at the early stages of drug discovery, that would be uh, along the lines of um, target identification, and um, we are using a whole bunch of techniques that have been talked about the last few days, um, uh, RNA-seq, chip-seq, protein-protein interactions, um, and we're trying to leverage this information uh, along with literature to try to um, uh, uh, find the best targets that are involved in memory formation. Um, and uh, so as a biologist, um, we've got a growing sense of our need to actually interact more and use uh, more computational bio um, uh, biology or bioinformatics in our uh, analysis of our data. And that's in part why we're at this uh, meeting to learn more about um, uh, the sorts of techniques um, and platforms that are being developed. Um, and I'll hand it off. All right. Uh, my name is Ravi Pandya. I work for Microsoft Research. So obviously you've heard of Microsoft, but I should give you a little background on Microsoft Research and uh, the, the particular, you know, the computational biology, which I don't think anyone has ever heard of. Um, yeah, so Microsoft as a whole is about 100,000 people. We have about 20,000 or so R&D people. Uh, Microsoft Research is about 1,000 uh, researchers worldwide. Um, and most of those obviously are in computer science. You could think of it as you know, the largest computer science department in the world. You, could go, you can go to many of the top computer science conferences and find 10 or 20% of the papers are from Microsoft Research. Um, but we do also engage in a variety of other things. And you know, the mission of Microsoft Research since it was established 20 years, over 20 years ago was both to advance the state of the art and to make sure Microsoft products had a future. And it's clear that the, you know, a lot of the future is going to be in biology. Um, so um, Microsoft Research has a number of locations working in computational biology in uh, Los Angeles working on GWAS, uh, linear mixed models and on um, looking, at, looking at HIV and HLA evolution um, and uh, assembling the sugarcane reference genome. Um, there are a number of people over in the main campus in Redmond working on genomics, which is where I work. Um, 
on alignment de novo assembly, variant calling, and cancer genomics. Um, there's a group in uh, MSR New England in Cambridge, Massachusetts, working on uh, network inference. And actually, we have a, a postdoc opening. If you want to talk to Tony Gitter about that, he can give you more information. Um, and uh, in uh, Cambridge, England, on DNA computing and actually modeling and simulation of cellular networks. Um, so, oh, uh, background is all blank. Let me give you my background. Um, I uh, actually went to the University of Toronto. It's great to be back here in Toronto. And uh, my background is, is in computer science and mathematics. I spent uh, time at a series of different startups, uh, and some of them were science related in uh, molecular modeling, and also another one later in nanotechnology. I've had a, um, at Microsoft, I've worked in security and operating systems, moved into Microsoft research a few years ago, initially in distributed systems, and then have always had a deep interest in, in biology and, and started working in the, the genomics field uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and so uh, the other aspect in terms of sort of thinking about uh, career advice, so I'm a computer scientist who's learned biology. I, I came to the, this conference uh, four years ago when it was at the Broad, and I, I, I can honestly say I was hanging on by my fingernails, maybe understanding every fourth word. Um, this year it's a lot better, and, and I can appreciate and understand the work down, that's going on here. <laughs> Did we dumb it down? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I just have, you know, it's been a learning process over the last few years. Um, and, uh, but I can also see that uh, in this field, obviously there are many opportunities in pharma, but there are also a lot of opportunities in software and uh, in the space of uh, diagnostics and genome interpretation in doing in silico screening. There's a variety of areas. I saw at least half a dozen different startups when I was at ASHG. And so I assume many of the people here would be biologists moving into computer science. And I think that would be, you know, starting to learn about computer science is, is a great way to uh, advantage if you're working in that in the field that being able to bridge that gap and find the synergies between the two fields is really valuable. Um, and so even in the biology work that we do at Microsoft Research, we really obviously come at it from a computer science and software point of view. And the kinds of things that are important in that field are things like, um, like key, key things, for example, is scalability. So the GWAS algorithms that we do um, are um, the typical, sort of the, the naive uh, linear mixed model algorithms are order of n cubed in time and order of n squared in space, where n is the number of features that you're analyzing. Um, our algorithm is linear, it's order of n in both. And that makes a huge difference in the amount of uh, data that we can analyze and the kinds of problems that we can solve. Or the, the uh, genome sequence alignment software that we work on has been designed for scalability in parallel. It, it scales almost linearly up to 64 cores, can be parameterized to run as fast as you can feed it data off the disk. Um, and especially if you're operating in a commercial environment building software, these kinds of things are really critical. Um, other things, obviously, like that computer scientists think about usability, maintainability, um, extensibility, those are all things that are sort of ideas and concepts that are really valuable if you think about moving into industry in a situation where software is really important. All right, and Kelly? Hi, I'm Kelly Norell. I have a PhD in computer science from Tel Aviv University. Then I moved to the US. I've been working for over three years at uh, IBM at the Computational Biology Center. Um, many have been working in collaborative competitions, but I also want to name it as, if you want, adding quality control to research. is basically what we do in DREAM or in Improver, that's the industrial version of DREAM. Um, I guess that's as background and then we can move to the other questions. All right, so I mean, I, before I you know, jump into any of mine, I'd, I'd like to sort of uh, have people really have a chance to just come up. Feel free to, um, I, actually, do you mind if I steal one of the two microphones from over there? Um, I, I'm gonna put it back at the podium over there and, and uh, please raise your hands, identify yourselves and ask uh, whatever question you're interested in, it can be one of those up there. So um, I'll, I'll invite people to come up right now.
Again, all these panelists are here for you guys, so don't be shy. Uh, this is uh, Xi Jin, uh, Stephen G from South Dakota State University. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask a panel about the, the uh, general um, opportunities in industry regarding students with a bioinformatics training. Um, I have been under the impression that uh, most of my students are going to postdocs academic world. Uh, the patients in industry is now that many. It's my impression. I'm not sure if that's right. Thanks. So, um, I, 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 I sort of understood about uh, I mean, I, the, 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 uh, there's a little bit of an echo, so I couldn't understand everything. But what you're, what, what you're asking specifically is not just about opportunities in industry, but also uh, uh, there was a critical part of your question that I'm not sure I, I, I heard, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I don't know if one of the panelists sort of heard it. Sorry? I did not understand. Yeah. So basically, are you, uh, were you specifically asking if it's a step up? Is well, that what you're asking? Well, I'm asking if uh, there's um, many opportunities in industry many for bioinformatics rather than academic. Yeah. But, uh, okay, I may have misunderstood, but I'm going to rephrase the, f the, the question in a slightly more, you know, challenging and perhaps critical and controversial way, especially with this panel, which is, is it uh, basically, I mean, certainly there's a lot of opportunities, and I, I don't think you need to, to say that much. There's a ton of opportunities in industry, and I know that my students are very heavily recruited in industry. I'm going to ask you a slightly more critical version of that question, which is, would you always advise a student to go to industry if they had a chance, especially coming from industry? What are some of the downsides? Can I, can I sort of actually twist the question to, to, to make it more critical? Because I think it's, it's a no-brainer that, yes, there's, there's a ton of very am amazing opportunities in industry. But what would be some of the downsides? And you know, would you recommend against it? Or, or in your view, is it the same in terms of? And I think that's related to the career path, basically moving between the two and what's better and when and why. So does anybody want to start? Well, so, I, I actually represent the academic side in terms <laughs> of but, um, I actually typically strongly recommend my students not to go immediately into industry, even if they want to go to industry later on. And the reason is that um, I think that the years in which you go through sort of a postdoc and you know, sort of your first years uh, in developing your career are really probably the most important years of your, of your life in terms of developing um, what you really want to do. And so right now, when you go to industry, you tend to be driven into a, a mode of activity that tends to be a little bit more project-oriented and specific. And so I think that it's, I, personally, I think that it's better to get in industry just a little bit later. So when you're mature, maybe a couple of years into your uh, uh, sort of first uh, fellow or independent position. Of course, none of my students listens to me. So I would say that more than, more than 60% of my students have gone to industry and are now all working, uh, you know, from Pfizer's to uh, Siemens to uh, to many other places. Uh, but but that's that's the general advice. So maybe it's great to get some comments from the industry counterpart telling me that I'm wrong. I, I actually, I, that's a question that I'm, I have for you guys. Basically, every time you know, I think I, I would echo you. Basically. Uh, I think part of the reason why you're successful is because your students don't listen to you, and it's, it's the same with me. So um, do people actually listen to you in industry? But, but that's a I, separate question. <laughs> I, I remember seeing an interview in an MIT paper once about someone who had, who had worked in government, industry, and academics, and he said that in the industry you had to worry if you told someone to do something because there's a good chance they would go off and try and do it, and in government you didn't have to worry about that quite so much, and in academics you're not supposed to tell people what to do. Um, <laughs> that's regrettably true, but <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's different. I mean, being, being in industry is different. You will have much more of a project focus. If you want to work on your great idea and you want to work on fundamental questions of, of science, that's maybe not the place to do it. On the other hand, there are applications which are maddeningly difficult and very enlightening to study, and you can be a consumer of the basic science that's produced by academics and use them in, uh, to solve problems that actually matter. I mean, Somebody put up this slide from Scannell's article in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery the other day that showed that on a log linear plot, the number of drugs per uh, billion dollars invested has been going down linearly for the last 60 years. If that doesn't frighten you, you're not paying attention. And if it doesn't inspire you, then maybe you want to work on an easier problem. But there are very, very hard problems there to be solved, and they can make a big difference to society, and they are intellectually very stimulating. Um, 
I have a job as what's called a methods developer, which means whenever there's a statistical problem that sort of standard techniques and our standard analysis frameworks don't work, they, it ends up, it's sort of all, all the weird stuff rolls downhill into my office and they say, can you invent something that will help us out here? So you, you can be very creative, but it does tend to have to have a focus. Uh, it, it, has to, uh, it has to fit in with, with the existing project guidelines. Could I ask you more details about that? So, I mean, do you have a team of postdoc level scientists who work with we you? Do, we do have some postdocs. Uh, we have one postdoc in my group right now. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have an opening, otherwise I'd be telling you that. Um, and and it's, actually, it's actually really interesting because they, they come out of academics and then they want to see what industry is like. And, and, and one of the things that I keep trying to tell people is that Within industry, inside the company, you have to get used to a much more rigorous amount of transparency than you would have uh, often, at least in my experience, in, in academics. Because if your decisions are going to be used to invest a billion dollars in 10 years of someone's life in, in, in making a drug, they're going to demand very, very detailed documentation and checkable evidence and reproducible research and see things done in multiple labs. That sort of scrutiny is, is very, very intense. And also, you know, people are frankly betting their lives on the results. So, you know, they, they do want to see that things can be reproduced. But there's a side to that, which is a company like Sanofi can afford to have this level of transparency internally. But not but externally then, so much. Yeah, yeah but not externally. Thing, right. And so, therefore, how does it work for a small startup where you don't have that large number of people sort of checking? I, I've, I've worked for small startups and I can tell you stories. Uh, there, there, there are often times where you know, people don't validate a target properly and they'll end up saying, oh, this is a metabolic target. Oops, no, it's a cardiovascular target. Oops, no, it's a cancer target. And they just sort of never converge. Um, uh, and and that's, that, that, that's a good way to spend lots of money that you don't have. So perhaps, again, I don't want to put words in, in, in anyone's mouth, but you know, perhaps a takeaway message might be that in a smaller company, the publishing is actually not detrimental in the sense that you, know, you can actually get peer-reviewed um, papers, you can get pu pu Publishing is not detrim detrimental at, at any phase, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, we, we do actually you know, encourage, allow publication. It's not rewarded in quite the same way that it is for academics. I mean, for, for us, for, 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 for us you know, the, the, the innovation comes in getting the compound into the clinic, into human beings, and approved and, 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 and you know, improving people's lives. And the technology that you use along the way, the methods you develop, are necessary, but they're not the primary focus like they would be for an academic. I don't know if any of your panelists want to add. We've touched upon like 10 different questions, so feel free to add on any of them. <laughs> um, so actually, you present a small startup. Um, I haven't um, worked at a large biotech for long, although I did do an internship at Serono at one point, and I've seen uh, that from the inside. Um, so the culture of a startup is uh, certainly different. As far as opportunities, my feeling is that, especially in computational systems biology, there are tons of opportunities. Like Manolis said, it's uh, a softball. There are lots of opportunities. And for instance, we're hiring. Um, just a shameless plug. Uh, I think uh, you can assume everyone is hiring here. <laughs> it's probably not a bad assumption, but in our case, we certainly are. Um, but uh, essentially, just to uh, elaborate on some of the differences and uh, uh, pluses and minuses of the industry, there's definitely project focus. Um, it manifests itself in an unusual way, actually. It's not so much do this project, don't do another. Of course, that's sort of a given, right? You have to do what is in the interest of the company. Um, but um, you know, in academia, at least in the lab where um, I trained, I felt a sense that I was encouraged to explore the space around me for the nearest possibility. For If not one, then another. The important thing was uh, to find something scientifically interesting and it didn't have to be along a certain line of research. So um, I've tried um, anything from lab work to different kinds of computational projects. I was completely free to explore. That's the point of uh, a lab, especially a large lab, um, like a lab that, uh, for instance, Andrea runs, is, uh, you know, which is a wonderful lab. Um, and so the, there you get a lot of freedom to try things and let them fail. In uh, the industry, you have to uh, have a high success rate. And of course, the hiring priority of industry as well is to find people who are um, interested in that kind of focus. So it's not that it's not research oriented. I actually think that currently, uh, especially computational systems biology, which I know the most about, um, is in a state where the difference between industry and academia is um, probably smaller than in many other fields. That's my, my feeling is that uh, a lot of things that I work on, and I frequently work with academic collaborators. Um, and one other difference that I should elaborate upon is because um, there are other priorities, especially in a small company, it's something to consider, it's harder to publish. Um, in, not just in terms of time, 
it's sometimes um, you don't necessarily depend, uh, you're not the only dependency in your publication cycle. There could be collaborators, they could have lawyers, their lawyers could have lawyers, and so by the time this <laughs> percolates through the chain, um, your project may be five years in the publication cycle. I actually literally have a paper that is slowly traveling uh, through the loops and it's at this point about four years old. I have to make a disclaimer that, you know, certainly everyone here are the folks who come to academic conferences. So uh, you may be representing an unusual, uh, you know, aspect uh, or at least a subset of uh, industry where you truly are academic. So, you know, everything uh, I think we here we should at least take with a, with a grain of salt just because this is the, fortun you know, the fortunate ones who actually get to come to these kind of conferences. So I actually kind of agree with that. And for anybody who's looking for a position in the industry, I very much recommend yeah, yeah, yeah. that you um, evaluate what you want and select um, the um, jobs that will keep your options open and make sure your work is interesting. It's as simple as that. So I'm going to interrupt here. and There will be more opportunity to make comments, but let's, let's take the next question. So. Uh, I kind of took something different from that the drug discovery graph, um, and so I was wondering if the panelists could comment on some other um, emerging industry applications for systems biology and uh, kind of where you see, you know, what what kind of companies we should be paying attention to or, or going after beyond beyond drug discovery. That is to say. So, so um, can anybody sort of, I mean, please rephrase the question before answering it, just, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page as to what you're actually answering. So I don't know who wants to take the mic. Ravi, go ahead. So I can certainly give one example of, of something beyond dr uh, drug discovery, which is simply looking at, you know, pharmacogenomics. Um, there is a huge panoply of drugs out there. We have a bunch of data about effects, about genomes. You know, systems biology can certainly speak to giving people a better... Uh, tailored experience and a better, you know, uh, you know, better effects, fewer side effects to the drugs that we already have, and, and I think that's a huge benefit. And I'm sure that's something that there are a number of interesting opportunities. There, there are actually two other applications I can think of for, for the methods of systems biology, if not actual the biology part, but the systems part of it. One is I used to work for a company called Harlequin that made uh, a, a network discovery tool for uh, police data investigations. Uh, and they would build nodes of people and places and events and money and drugs and things like that and try and guide how investigations would happen and court cases would be presented. I'm not really happy about the surveillance applications, but you know, that, 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 that sort of data does exist in other, other venues. Um, I, there's some other people, uh, ITA software was acquired by Google, I think, and they did something similar for airline scheduling in which you had massive amounts of data about airplanes and schedules and fuel and crew rosters and, and how long the pilots have been awake and things like that, and you had to discover what is the rate limiting step here and how do you optimize that in, in a way that's very similar to discovering, you know, you're sort of reverse engineering how the, how the genes work inside the cell. Uh, the, the company is allegedly an engineered artifact, but it's so complicated and things just happen that, you know, in fact, you are discovering something that's a product of economic evolution. So there are lots of applications like that. You can go far afield from systems biology and, and your, your mathematical modeling expertise that you find here, if that's your idiosyncrasy, it can carry you lots of different directions. Let me, again, rephrase the, the question slightly as you guys are going through it, which is, uh, I, I, you know, partly it's also what are the business models? In other words, you know, um, you know the, the, the drug development business model is obvious. You're going to cure a bunch of people, you're going to sell a bunch of drugs, you're going to make money. But, uh, you know, what are some of the other sort of uh, types of business models uh, that for either startups that, you know, folks in this room could start, or for you know uh, young companies that folks in this room can join, and uh, you know what's the monetization scheme, if you wish. Uh, go ahead, Andre. So I think that you know a very important area right now that attracts a lot of people that are quantitatively oriented is the development of new technology or biotechnology. So when you think about you know a company like Illumina or uh, you know any of the other uh, that, that make uh, equipment that is used now to quantitate the omics in the cell. That's a burgeoning and exploding industry, and they use a lot of sort of quantitation uh, and quantitative methods. So th that's certainly another area that is not necessarily drug discovery based, but is actually more diagnostic is, and has been really um, also exploding. Like, it used to be the case that, for instance, diagnostic biomarkers were sort of the poor uh, uh, brothers or the poor cousins of, of, of drugs, and now 
you can't develop a drug without a biomarker. And in fact, uh, assessing uh, sort of going towards more personalized or precision medicine is really very much dependent on using molecular diagnostic tools. So that's another area that is quite uh, relevant. And, and, and there's an entire industry then that assists, uh, for instance, you know, companies that generate um, either literature or network models uh, that sort of assist pharmaceutical company making decisions either about how to run a clinical study like a CRO or a computationally enabled CRO or uh, sort of in, yes, ingenuity, et cetera, who uh, sort of p collect literature data to give you sort of better model for for, for uh, investigational biological system. Th those are all very interesting. And, that, and the final thing I have to say that um, quite a number of, for instance, my students went to work for companies like Philips and Siemens, um, which normally you wouldn't think about, you know, related to, to systems biology, but they have to do with the fact that, you know, companies that make very large equipment for diagnosis of patients in hospitals, for instance, are becoming increasingly dependent on, on the ability to quantitate and use molecular markers. And so that the other phase, not the market development, but how you actually use the markers in, in an actual piece of equipment that makes a decision about a patient. So I see at least two students up, so I'm sorry for going out of order here, but maybe we can prioritize the students who have uh, questions. So, uh, oh, go ahead. I mean, th that's fine. If you, if you count as a student, go, go for it. Um, well, so. I'm in a similar situation, having been in industry and come back to academia. I'm now in the fifth year of my PhD program and on my way out. But I'm interested in what the opportunities are in academia coming to it late. I mean, if I add up the years, postdoc plus a few years at a tenure track before getting tenure, maybe if I'm lucky I'll get tenure right about the traditional retirement age. So is there actually a path or should I really be looking at industry? Could you repeat what you said at the very end? So the question is, if you're already a certain age as you're starting, as you're into your postdoc, how many more years should you be, you know, counting before you start your faculty job? Uh, and yeah. is industry a viable alternative? Yeah, I mean, I could answer on the academia side, which is, uh, I mean, if you do the math uh, for a typical student, it could be, you know, maybe five to six years for your PhD, and then another two, three years at least for your postdoc. Mm -hmm. And then for tenure, another at least seven years. So you can do the math. But um, you know, these are typical numbers. There are exceptions. Uh, you can go faster or slower. If you already have a lot of industry experience, you may be able to you know, short circuits many of those. And then I know I, I have friends who worked in a, you know, um, n not quite PhD level, but in an academic setting doing research. So in particular at the Broad Institute who are then hired directly at the level of associate professor. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you have a particular number of years in industry, uh, I, th I think academia will appreciate that mm -hmm. and move the tenure clock much faster. So you don't have to think of yourself as a, as a traditional student. And I don't know, Andrea, as a department chair, whether you could, do you want to comment more on that? I mean, I, I, I mean. Interesting point because, for instance, you know, I, I had a recent, uh, recent, you know, it's like oh, the last uh, eight years, um, one of the people that decided to come in as a postdoc in the lab was um, Pavel Sumazin, who actually already had a job as an assistant professor um, at uh, Oregon State. And the reason he decided to come as a postdoc because he had a job as an assistant professor in computer science. Um, and he really wanted to be connected with the biology, and he felt that without really sort of doing the hardcore thing, and and and, and he has been has become so incredibly productive over that period of time that I think that his career would have not burgeoned the same way that it's done if he had stayed. Um, is now a professor at Baylor, and um, you know is, is, I think this has been really very helpful for for his uh, for. Um, other situation, you know, without making names, but there are other people that are coming in the lab at, you know, very sort of advanced, not advanced age, but, so, but in terms of people that have already developed in terms of a career, and they could be very well, you know, having, you know, an associate professor position and come in uh, with roles that are more sort of faculty but non-tenure track oriented working in a lab. And that's also a possibility because um, one thing that happens in many universities, uh, I don't know, some of them have rules. I think Stanford, for instance, you cannot move from non-tenure track to tenure track, but for instance, Columbia, you can. So you can stay for a certain period of time and really develop phenomenally uh, valuable um, um, sort of your own scientific agenda. 
and at the same time do that with the help of a lab ahead that can help you get funded with your own grants, for instance, or your own transitional grants. And then all of a sudden, when you're ready, when you can make that decision in your career, you can actually switch track and potentially go directly for tenure if you, if you want, if, if, if the uh, publication record and the funding is there. So I think there's a lot of flexibility. I think age is no longer as much of a, of a, of a problem as it used to be. I mean, the question is just, and, and it, I have to, very interesting, I have to say, like, uh, I, I know quite a number of people that, um, essentially have become more productive in their 70s than they've ever been. I mean, it's like these people are like one cell paper, one nature paper after another, uh, and, and other people that at some point simply give up. So I, think I would say it's very much with you. What do you want to do and how you want to do it? It's, it's about the mind, it's not about uh, uh, your, your physical age. Let's take the next question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Yuri Raymond, uh, postdoc here in Toronto. Uh, Speak up a little bit. OK, hi. Uh, so my question is about intellectual property in general. Uh, as academic researchers, we're building tools and algorithms, and often we publish them as open source to build on our papers and impact, and looking into the future and give them to the community. Uh, however, when people seem, it seems to me that people working in industry tend to keep it more closed uh, due to intellectual property uh, rights. And uh, then I wonder, how does that in impact people who would uh, start in academia, move into industry for a little while, and maybe potentially come back later, because in academia it's either publish or perish, and would that sort of, those years stayed in industry, are they lost in terms of academic uh, openness? So I can answer briefly on the academia side. I think your question is basically um, publishing versus patenting, and how is it valued between the two, and is the currency uh, exchange rate uh, favorable in one direction or the other? Uh, so the way that I, uh, that I would answer is that in, in academia, patents are actually valued. So basically, when you come back from industry to academia, uh, as part of your publications, I think, you know, listing your patents can have an effect both on your promotion case, on your tenure case, on your hiring case, and so on. So I think, I think that currency is actually valued in academia. So uh, I don't know who wants to answer on the industry side. Kelly? From the IBM research point of view, at least where in the department I work, we are encouraged to publish. Sometimes you have to put the patent first, but then you can publish. And for something that you will not write the patent, you go ahead and actually I've been publishing more since I'm in at IBM than when I was working full time in academia. So I guess depends on the group you're working with. Thank you. Any other panelists want to add anything, or we'll take the next one. Uh, so as a postdoc, if you want to go on uh, the academic track, it's kind of obvious what, like, uh, there's a lot of um, well laid out track, like you should learn to write grants, uh, teach classes. But if you're interested in uh, kind of making yourself marketable for industry, how do you, uh, what kind of skills should you develop and how should you put them out there? That's a great question. Actually, I'll, I'll, I have a brief comment on that, and I'll pass on the mic. Uh, essentially, I, you mentioned teaching. I think it's actually a very relevant skill even in the industry. Not so much for the teaching itself, but because you need to be able to explain your ideas. There's quite a lot of collaboration going on. If anything, it's probably harder, uh, because when you teach, you can sometimes ignore the results of your um, unfortunate efforts. Um, whereas uh, in the industry, you know, it comes back to you very quickly. You're dealing with people who are smart, sometimes fairly aggressive, and uh, frequently come from other companies and will not suffer um, bad presentation and organization of ideas as well. Yeah, I would say the, the same, same thing is that uh, uh, being able to communicate with other scientists um, uh, within the company is absolutely essential. Um, and. Um, you know, building those skills as much as possible. Um, thinking about, you know, what, it, for example, for within the drug discovery, sort of thinking about what aspects of um, drug discovery are, are interesting to you um, and um, the sorts of techniques that are sort of on the cutting edge for that aspect of drug, drug discovery. 
um, I think are also important. Uh, so, you know, the techniques really depend on what aspect of science you're, you're, you're really interested in. And, and having good knowledge of, of what those techniques are is, uh, and being able to communicate that is important in our company, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to agree with what everybody else has said. When I was in, when I was in, in school, I loved teaching. That was like the, 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 the best part, really, of some of, my, some of my graduate education. The moment when an undergrad suddenly, their mouth opens up and they say, oh, that's what you're talking about. That, that's just the most wonderful thing to know that you can do that for somebody. And that's an essential skill for industry because you have to come to a result. I can come to a result that has the best p-value ever, but if I can't convince somebody that it means something and that it should motivate them to make a decision for their project, which will then guide them along the right track, then I haven't done anything. Um, so a lot of what uh, I have to do, at least in, in, in our group, is try and get people to think about what's the most pedestrian method you can imagine that would make your point, convince your audience, and move on and not get them tangled up in, you know, why you chose this kernel or that kernel versus for your support vector machine. because. I mean, yeah, that's fascinating to us, but they don't care. And so, but they do care about the result, and you have to make them care about the result and believe the technique that you use to do it. And, and that, 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 that's really something that as an academic, you have to be able to, to write papers that will get people, people have to read your papers in order for them to have a high impact factor. And similarly here, you have to be able to, to summarize your work in such a way that people will care about the result that you reached. There was one more uh, Thank question. You. Hi, I'm a senior graduate student uh, from Cornell University. My name is Brandon Barker, and I was just curious if uh, we could hear a little bit more about some of the overhead for uh, your jobs that goes on in industry. So the most typical form of overhead that comes to mind in academia <laughs> is writing grants, and maybe, although it's not exactly overhead, we've already heard a little bit about um, the issue of attaining tenure. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, to hear if, a little bit more about maybe some of the negatives um, in industry. Well, you, you're not going to escape grant writing. It'll, it'll look different. You still have to make project proposals. If you're the sort of person who doesn't make project proposals, other people will and you'll always end up working for them. So you, you're always going to have to either be the project proposal writer or, or be an ally of that person in order to get input into experimental design, appropriately powered data sets, uh, analysis methods, that sort of thing. Um, you, don't, you don't escape that. Oh. <coughs> Tenure is um, not so much of an issue, unfortunately. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, look, sur surviving for, for, for 10 years in, 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 in an industrial environment requires the same sort of skill set that it requires for an academic. You have to be able to negotiate with people, sometimes negotiate from a position where the other person has all the power. You have to be able to make arguments clearly and forcefully without antagonizing people, um, all that sort of thing. Um, there is some, uh, it, particularly if you go into the clinical side of drug development, then there's a whole other layer of overhead that I've so far tried to avoid because now you have to deal with uh, what's called GXP, good clinical practice, good, good laboratory practice stuff, which is FDA guidelines and regulated, and you have to document everything right down to the version number of your operating system. And, and that, 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 that's all painful, but it's so that the FDA can reproduce what you did. That, that, that's a whole different area. Now, in, in the more research area, it's not, it's not technically all that different in the sense that you still have to write, you still have not essentially write a grant proposal, but you have to say, okay, among the things that our management is likely to fund, can I invent a project which will, you know, be something to which they're going to commit some resources. Is the experience different for any of our other panelists, or is this similar? Mm -hmm. It's pretty similar. I'll say Microsoft Research actually is relatively free. The, the project that I started, that I'm on, was actually started by someone working in distributed systems. Saw a talk by, uh, on cancer by David Hausler and had an idea of how to do sequencing algorithms. He didn't even tell his manager for a couple of months and the guy said, okay, sounds like, sounds like an interesting project, keep going. Um, we may be unique that way. I mean, still obviously over time have to deliver results, but the assumption is that the, the kind of people that we hire are, are, will be able to do that. So um, there is also kind of an extreme of the industry, which is a small company. And the smaller the company, the more uh, visible this particular uh, feature is that, uh, but, but it's also true of some bigger companies as well, where um, the company is too small for the amount of work it's trying to do and everybody is just too busy. 
Um, and yeah. that happens, I've certainly seen people in uh, big pharma who are constantly overworked and are not able to keep their head above water. And so that's kind of a challenge in time management. I personally feel like you know, the uh, ability to set your deadlines a little more is uh, better in the academic world. But at the same time, it's not always like that. You know, for instance, our company has grown up a little, there's more time. So, um, time management, basically. I, uh, as an academic, I can assure you that we're sort of struggling with <laughs> many of the similar issues of take on way too many things for the number of hours in the day and the number of people in the lab and the number of fingers on each person's hands and so on. Complicated uh, by grants. More, sorry? Complicated by grants. <laughs> exactly. So every, every lab, I think, is a small startup. So uh, uh, last question or uh, last two questions. I have a question, so moving back to the subject of, subject of patents. So this year there was a very strong case in the US whether genes should or can be patentable and the Supreme Court at the end decided to make that illegal. So I was wondering, uh, do you think there is other, st other things in the, like that we should give up on patenting that could facilitate R&D in the industry or certain other things that are not patentable now but we should make them? Uh, and uh, that, that's a tough one, to be honest. I, I don't know if uh, uh, it's at our pay grade to, 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 to debate this question. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a fascinating question. It's a great subject of the debate. Maybe our industry panel next year can, uh, can, uh, can take <laughs> on that question for the whole hour. Gustavo. <coughs> so I wanted to give a perspective of something I'm not sure was uh, discussed, uh, especially for the uh, students that might consider going to industry. There is something that you can do in industry that you cannot do in... Oh. <laughs> so, no, no, I, I wanted to say, imagine the possibility of doing something much bigger than yourself, much bigger than what you can do, for example, if you have, you know, if you are... You know, assistant professor, you typically you can do lots of things, but typically you are a small operation. In the best cases, you are part of a bigger group like TCGA or ENCODE and so on, and you are part, but imagine that you are part of the machinery that creates, for example, uh, the, next, the next single cell um, sequencer. That requires an amount of coordination and a, an amount of funding that is rarely found in academia. You know, if you want to do, for example, as, as we saw in IBM, for example, when they created the fastest supercomputer, you know, in, uh, they put $100 million um, and a team of, you know, about 100 people, and off they went, you know, and, and, and they made a supercomputer that was fastest than the fastest uh, supercomputer there. And something similar happened with the, in IBM when they, they did this... Um, um, you know, publicity stunt with Jeopardy, you know, some of you uh, who are in the United States uh, know what Jeopardy is and there was a machine called Watson and they put a lot of money, a lot of people and uh, they, they tried to solve this uh, natural language uh, problem, you know, a processing problem. So I think, you know, just, just, and probably there are many more examples, I have a little bit IBM centric because I have been IBM for 15 years. But there are lots of more examples in which you can imagine do something enormous, like you know the next fMRI machine, you know, or the, or the first fMRI machine that someone did, you know, must have been an enormous accomplishment. Or imagine, you know, uh, not in a uh, in a in a in a uh, completely industrial con context, but the Los Alamos, you know, the atomic bomb project, you know, from nothing in five years, they generating something that was incredibly powerful, destructive, and, you know, a, a, a breakthrough uh, of science and technology. So that is what you can do in industry that probably you cannot do in academia. And it will not happen every day. It might happen once in a, in a lifetime. But I think this is something to, to have into account. If you are not so too self-centered, you know, you can form part of a team that could do something that can change, you know, the decade or, or the world. So that's wanted to say that. No, that's a, I think that's a very, very good point to, to think about, <laughs> namely, 
when does something become too big for a single lab or too big for a single startup or too big for even a single company? And the Los Angeles example, for example, uh, that was a government initiated sort of, hey, let's transform things. Similar for the Human Genome Project, where you know um, a, a single entity basically said, hey, let's 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 actually do this, and brought together dozens of labs across the world. And similarly for the Encode Project, the Roadmap Project, and so on, where it's just bigger than what any single group can do. And I think um, I mean what's what's uh, I think that's something that that holds true both in industry and in academia. The fact that there are uh, a, sm a, f a small number of opportunities in our lifetimes to be part of something much bigger than, than ourselves. And I know that you know, many of us in this room have sort of jumped on that wagon a couple of times, and it's, it's an incredible experience. Um, I think the last, uh, we've, I mean, when, I'm, when I look back at that, I think we've, we've covered a lot of these topics. The last one, and I, I might get vetoed on this, is uh, specific to our conference. Namely, it's about regulatory and systems genomics. Um, when we start thinking about drug development, when we start thinking about disease, I mean, clearly uh, our field is, is really becoming front and center. And I think if you, if you went to uh, ACHG this year, the American Society of Human Genetics Conference, there, there was just a, a record number of the sort of regulation-centered talks where people are, you know, recognizing what the data is telling us, which is that the vast majority is really non-coding. I think one of the questions for uh, some of the folks here on the panel, and I don't know if you guys are able to answer this, is are you, I mean, maybe even at Sanofi, I mean, how do we go from having a single target, which is the traditional way of doing medicine, to actually treating systems? And how do we go from genes to treating regulatory regions? So I don't know if you've struggled with that and if you have any insights to share. Yeah, ah, there we are. Okay, so uh, we, we've actually uh, changed oncology actually quite a bit in the last couple of years. Uh, we were trying very hard not to produce any more general broad cytotoxic drugs uh, in the hope that they just poison the cancer cells slightly faster than they poison you. But every therapy should be a, a molecularly targeted cancer for which we have a very specific uh, indication with a mutational context or a copy number amplification context that we think is the driver gene. But at a, at, a, at a more systems level, we're really, really interested in uh, some work on synergy, uh, where we happen to know that you know there's a system that interacts here, and we have two points of attack, which can create either synthetic lethality or even just empirically, we observe you know in a large screen that you know the MDM2 compound I told you about is synergistic with a MEK inhibitor in the context of RAS-activated uh, cancers, and that's actually quite interesting because we recognize that. Most of the diseases we're trying to attack are multifactorial. Um, the, uh, the metabolic group, about which I know uh, somewhat less, recognizes that uh, type 2 diabetes is actually a very complex disease, and it actually uh, uh, is, is attackable with the system's approach by using either multiple compounds or compounds administered in a particular order, in a particular dose schedule, to sort of, you know, allow certain kinds of recovery and prevent other kinds of recovery. So that's, that, that's actually, you know, quite, quite well understood and quite fruitful. So I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I stood up to see you better, so I, <laughs> I, 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 that wasn't a, a cue for. <laughs> so I was at a um, uh, policy meeting on cancer at the IOM, Institute of Medicine, on, on Monday last week. And it was, I was really surprised because you would expect cancer policy to be really about society and people and really very generalizable concept. And about half of the meeting was dedicated to systems biology and, and sort of systems approaches. And I wanted to say that. Right now, the people, it was, it was very interesting, the, the rep, one of the two representatives from the FDA said that she was really worried about using systems biology for approving drugs. And the reason it became very apparent is because certain people think that, in fact, you have to either drug or you have to actually monitor the system. System biology and regulatory genomics are actually about discovering what are the to, to, to use a word that, uh, that Levi Garraway stole from me, what are the coalescence points of the system such that it doesn't matter how you broke it, you have to go through those particular vulnerability points in cancer or maybe those drivers of you know, neurotoxicity in ALS, et cetera, so that you can now have not maybe one gene, but maybe a couple of genes, maybe three genes, but it's not a system. You, know, you discover it through a system, but it's not a system. 
And so I think that basic, the way I, at least I see uh, systems biology becoming really relevant is by becoming the reductionistic lens that, look, that looks at the entire complexity of biology and then finds out how to reduce it to just a very, very simple thing that you can understand and from, from which you can implement an actionable hypothesis. And rather than dragging the system, we've got to drag the genes that make the system work. And I mean, maybe I can talk about the regulatory uh, aspect of that, which is, um, I mean, and again, I don't know how much you guys are already doing this, but I mean, more and more we're realizing that many of these cancer inhibitors are in fact regulators who actually have global effects on a cell. And I think a, a challenge, and I think, uh, you know, uh, a challenge for our community uh, is to really sort of understand how these large scale uh, perturbations actually coalesce back down to uh, you have extremely specific responses uh, and um, sort of you know solve the, the 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 way that one can target thousands of regions across the genome through individual regulators and combinations of these regulators uh, in order to actually have predictable but systems and global uh, scale uh, effects. So uh, I think that's that's a place of, of really convergence between the two fields. Yeah, I, I want actually to to emphasize the point you make, Arnold, because. In, in the end, so I organized a meeting on cancer systems biology with the ACR and the Brain uh, Tumor, uh, National Brain Tumor Foundation. And it was very interesting because we went around the room and said, okay, what, how do you decide that a field is now mature to the point that it's actually having an impact on society? And well, you can count the publication, you can count the number of grants that are from, but in reality, the thing that people really, for instance, when they were asking, what has genomics done for, for, for medicine? They wanted to know how many drugs have been put into clinical trials because of that, okay? And, and, and you have to remember that systems biology is a very recent field compared to, you know, even genomics, because, you know, about five years ago, we didn't have any map of regulatory behavior that were genome-wide. Um, and so I was very excited because this year we got the first approval for, you know, we got a literally in one month and a half with a letter of intent to actually test a combination therapy that was completely generated uh, using systems biology approaches in collaboration with uh, Jose Silva's lab in my lab, you know, in, in breast cancer. And it's something that simply you could not, it really could not have understood without having that understanding of, of global regulation because it's an autocrine loop that activates a completely independent pathway, and so unless you suppress two pathways, you don't get the effect. Um, and the data ended up being so convincing that, you know, even though in the beginning they told us it would take probably six months just to get this thing through the starting blocks, in one month and a half it was actually signed. Um, and, and it's now going to be a phase one, phase two clinical trial. So I'm really hopeful that from this complexity of, uh, you know, the way people perceive, uh, like the FDA representative systems of being too complex to understand, we now can work out some, some, some really very simple empirical rules that are going to drive clinical experimentation and the design of biomarkers and, 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 and pharmaceutical active compounds that can deal with these kind of problems. And I think the burden is now upon us, uh, just going back to one of the earlier points that was emphasized by all of the, of the panelists, which is uh, you have to make it understandable. You have to convey with such clarity the results of your systems level and regulatory genomics level uh, uh, results. Um, you have to convey them with such clarity that uh, it is, again, bulletproof and respected to the level of a single drug target. So I think I'll, I'll just make a couple of closing remarks to basically say that the, the field is really transforming. I think we've seen our conference mature from, uh, you know, certainly always at the cutting edge, uh, as, as everybody who has come to this meeting has testified, but, but this cutting edge has been progressing closer and closer and closer to uh, understanding really systems uh, at the nucleotide level and at the system scale simultaneously. And I think that, that's really the, the, the complexity of the system. Uh, and I think that level of complexity uh, has been also moving from simply observation to now perturbation and uh, as Dream illustrates to sort of, you know, design reverse engineering uh, and, and really medicine uh, ultimately. So I'm, I'm very positive about sort of where this field is going. I'm very excited about where our conference has been taking us. And I, I really want to thank all our panelists for sort of giving us a glimpse here of a side that's traditionally not have been, uh, has not been very well represented in our meeting, but which we hope in, in future years will really be a sizable portion of this meeting as the field really makes it possible to move closer to intervention, to medicine, to solving real world challenges and sort of changing um, 
life and mankind and you know health. So thank you to everyone. And I want to thank you all for coming. Again, the panelists are here. Come hunt, hunt them down right now. But then they'll be around uh, throughout the meeting. And uh, thank, thank you all for staying over time. I think we switched things. Where's yours?